Uh, it's an organization that promotes social ecology and the ideas of um, communalism and uh, the thinking uh, through the thinking of uh, Mary Bookchin. We are based in Athens, but we have a lot of members uh, from all over the world, uh, mainly in, in Europe, in uh, Canada, um, and uh, we uh, organize conferences, publications, and uh, soon we will uh, set up a new, new webinars on direct democracy. Uh, this event on the Paris Commune, as you know, which is in his, in, uh, in, in his, in his inner, because Commune was uh, uh, feminine, uh, in her uh, 150th anniversary, uh, was for us very important because, uh, as you may know, uh, the Commune is a meaningful uh, experience, although it is very, um, it is, it is in, in, in a specific context uh, of Paris, uh, which was on, on war and which was with a very strong uh, poverty of the uh, workers and uh, uh, governed by the, uh, by, by the conservatives. Uh, so Paris Commune is, a, is, an, is an experience uh, of uh, uh, seven to days of uh, what, one of the nearest form of direct democracies at such a city of Paris in that time, 100 and millions, uh, no, 1 million and, and 800 uh, thousand people were living in Paris. So it's one of the hugest experience of uh, direct democracy uh, that we can, um, that we know in the contemporary history. So it was very important for us uh, to commemorate this commune at international levels, and but also to exchange uh, on the different ownerships uh, of this history and maybe the debates and to explore what is the myth, what is a reality and how can this inspire our, our current uh, practices of uh, communalism, social ecology, and uh, anti-capitalist uh, thoughts. So to have, uh, to, for this panel, we have the chance to have people from all over the world. And I would like to thank really much also uh, Black Roses Books and uh, PM, PM uh, Press for uh, being a, a partner for the organization of this, uh, web, of this conference. And I would like to thank particularly Mitchell Abido, who is a translator and a writer of PM Press. He has written several books on the Paris Commune, uh, the main of them, the Paris Commune of 1871, uh, and uh, as told by those who fought for, for it. Uh, thank you, Mitchell, for being here. You will begin this, uh, uh, this uh, conference with uh, telling telling us the history uh, of the commune and uh, also departing it from this uh, myth, uh, departing the myth from the reality. Uh, thank you also to Dimitri Rosopoulos, uh, very well known, he's from Tries, he's from Black Roses Books, and he has written a lot on direct democracy, he has known Mary Bokshin, and he's from uh, the very uh, great exper experience of um, Milton Park, which is a, a community land trust of uh, Montreal, resisting capitalist and urban capitalism. Thank you, Dimitri. Uh, we also have Anna uh, Korwash, who is from uh, Genealogy uh, Academia. Is, she is uh, currently in Rojava, and thank you very much for being with us. She will uh, let us know a little bit what are the now the the experiences of the almost 10 years of uh, confederalism, democratic confederalism in Rojava and the main challenges. I think you will also insist on the links with the commune and also on the feminist approach. Thank you so much for being here. And um, also I would like to thank Theo, Theo Rouet, who is a member of TRIES. I think you're now in Madrid, Theo. And uh, he will talk a little bit about uh, coming back to France, uh, what, what is now the significance uh, of the commune for the French uh, social movement today, focusing also on the Yellow Vest movement. 
So thank you of, for all of us. Just some technical point before uh, we begin. Uh, this conference is recorded. So um, if you want not to appear, you can ask a question on the chat. Uh, you can also ask question on uh, in French or Spanish. We will uh, try to, to translate it. Um, uh, also that uh, this, we are in direct also in, in YouTube. Uh, we will have two hours conference or two hours on a whole, beginning by the speakers, and then we will have an exchange with uh, people uh, that, that, that are connected. Uh, so let's begin, Mitchell, if you don't mind, uh, with uh, your, um, your uh, speech. Uh, can you please tell us about the commune, the Paris commune? Okay, thank you, Magali, and thanks everybody for uh, inviting me here. So I'm gonna start with uh, just a very brief uh, background for those of you who aren't familiar with, uh, with, that familiar with the commune. So the commune was an outgrowth of the, uh, the French defeat in the Franco-Prussian War, 1870-1871. Uh, don't want to go too much into the history of the Franco-Prussian War. So France was defeated, France, uh, Paris was besieged, and finally uh, France surrendered, and German Prussian troops surrounded Paris. The, there was a government of national defense that was set up, and on March 18th, 1871, uh, the army was sent to uh, remove the cannons that were up in uh, Montmartre, working class neighborhood at the time. Cannons that had been paid for by the, the people of Montmartre. The people on, in Montmartre did not refuse to give up their cannons. And in fact, they killed uh, the two generals who were leading the troops who, uh, who came to take the cannons away. Uh, at that point, this is the beginning of the Paris Commune. For a week, the city is run by the National Guard, which was the people in arms. And on March 26th, elections were held for the, the Paris Commune. That would be the ruling body, the governing body of Paris during the course, most of the 72 days. Uh, elections were held on, on March 26th, and there were three distinct factions on the Commune. The first were people who, dis, who defined themselves as neo-Jacobins. They were the heirs of uh, Robespierre. The second group were the followers of Auguste Blanqui, the greatest French revolutionary of the time, who unfortunately, though he'd spent his entire life uh, expecting the revolution to always be a week from Thursday, when the revolution finally took place, he was in, uh, in jail for having led a failed revolt a few months earlier. And the third group, and the smallest one, and they came to be known as the minority, were the members of the, uh, the French branch, the Parisian branch of the First International. Uh, so there was, those were the three groups. The, the Paris Commune is formed. It's a legislative body like any other legislative body, except it has no permanent head of state. Uh, the, so the, the government, the, uh, the French government had fled to Versailles and almost immediately starts attacking the commune. So the commune is basically at war the entire time of its existence with the, the French government. Brief, briefly, communes are set up in other parts of France, all, but all of which are pretty quickly uh, crushed. So Paris, it's essentially a war of Paris against the rest of France. Uh, the, the commune meets 90 some odd, uh, not 90 some odd times. Uh, the, com the commune meets and it passes laws, uh, it debates laws, it has a uh, journal officiel, an official journal where it prints its decrees and news that's going on around, uh, around France and particularly in Paris. And, uh, but it's under attack the entire time. Finally, on May 21st, after fighting had been going on sporadically in the outskirts of Paris, on May 21st, the troops from Versailles managed to breach the walls of Paris. And that's the beginning of what came to be known as the Bloody Week. The troops of Versailles come in and they begin slaughtering everybody who they come across, who they suspect of having been a communard, a supporter of the commune. 
And the methods for discovering who these were were if you were wearing a National Guard uniform, that was it. If they would ask people uh, to lower their, their shirts, and if there was a bruise on the shoulder from the recoil of a rifle, that was reason enough for somebody to be executed. There's some debate about how many people were killed, but over the course of this week, somewhere between 5,400 and 20,000 people uh, were killed as the Versailles troops went through uh, Paris and wiped out the, the commune. The, uh, afterwards, members of the commune or supporters of the commune were deported to New Caledonia, were deported to some to Algeria. Most of them went into, who were threatened, went into exile, Switzerland, Belgium, England, and a few even to, to the US. An amnesty was granted uh, in 1880 that allowed all the communards to come back. And uh, it became, it was always a subject of both debate, you know, what the commune did right, what the commune did wrong, but it also became a foundational myth. So I can segue right into my talk, a foundational myth of a part of the left, of the left, both in France and, uh, around the world. And if I'm saying myth, it's, I'm not putting a negative spin on this. Georges Sorel, the great uh, theoretician, spoke about how important myths were in, uh, in any social struggle. And in fact, so I have a quote here that, you know, the, it's only through myths that an intelligible exposition of the passing of principles into action can take place. So the commune became a foundational myth for a certain left. And you can see by the, the mix on this panel here, it became a different myth for every single part of the left. So anarchists claimed the commune as an anarchist uh, event, even though it had a government, even though it had elections. Uh, it had departments that they called commissions. Communists claimed it as, as theirs, although Lenin and Trotsky had been very critical of it. Uh, socialists claimed it, and even, and probably the, the group that had like the greatest right was the Freemasons who supported the commune. Uh, but so what I would like to talk about though is the specificity of the commune so we could understand how mythologized it's become, which doesn't mean that it was, that it was a, a fraud that's been perpetrated on the left or that the left has perpetrated on itself. But it's, the commune, like any revolution, grew out of very specific circumstances, many of which are not replicable elsewhere, although the inspiration you can draw from the commune isn't diminished by the, that specificity. So, for example, if the commune has become a myth for every, for, that was still, here it is 150 years later, we're talking about it, uh, and this is my third talk about it, and I've written numerous articles about it, and I've attended conferences about it all over the world. So its power, it, it's still a potent uh, force, its myth. But the commune itself was the result of a myth. And that's the myth of the French Revolution. Because for the communards, they were completing the work and continuing the work of the French Revolution. I said that the largest uh, group on the commune were the neo-Jacobins. These were people who still admired Robespierre. Even the very the name of the Paris Commune is borrowed from the French Revolution. It was the body that ruled revolutionary Paris between 1789 and 1795. When later in the uh, uh, when the commune the the commune as its legislative body meets, they form they vote to form a committee of public safety, which is what Robespierre and Saint Just and Couton and all the others had uh, established in the glorious years, the heroic years of the French Revolution. So the, the commune was itself the, the fruit of and the bearer of the myth of the French Revolution. I mean, so strong was, 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 the, uh, was the French Revolution, that it had, so strong was its hold, rather, that uh, even the revolutionary Blanqui, when he had a news, uh, published a newspaper, he used the slogan of the soldiers of the year two, la patrie en danger. 
And when the members of the International put out two uh, posters, two, uh, they were called the La Fiche Rouge, they were red posters that were put up condemning the actions of the existing Republican government, the government of national defense. They condemned it for not strongly enough defending against the Germans. So the notion of there was no such thing as revolutionary defeatism, where we, whereas we think uh, revolutionary defeatism is an integral part you know, of revolutionary action, for the communards it wasn't. They were defending France, they were defending Paris, and most of all, they were defending the Republic, without which nothing else was possible. Uh, so, and now I want to talk about some of the things that, that we've come to believe, and I, have, and I have to be honest about this, that I did, Magali mentioned that I, uh, that I published a couple of books on the, on the commune, and when I did them, all I did was read, and Dimitri is going to talk about it also, all I read was accounts of communards, because I wasn't interested in the opinions of people who didn't have to make decisions on the ground that what Marx had to say in London was really of no interest to me because he didn't have to make any decisions with the, with the Versailles troops firing at them. And the more I read of, of the, uh, the communards, the more convinced I became that they didn't quite fit the image that we have of revolutionaries uh, today. So for example, patriotism is something that's totally foreign to us and justifiably so, but it wasn't uh, foreign to them. Now, Magali mentioned direct democracy, and it certainly was a democracy, but I'm not convinced that it was a direct democracy because uh, it was, the commune was not like Occupy, where people sat in their forums and they you know, wagged their fingers in agreement or, or they disagreed. There was elections, as I said, on March 26th, and then they were even in the middle of uh, being bombarded they held by-elections in April. So it was a, a democracy. It had elections. Uh, it had uh, departments within, within the, uh, the government, which they called commissions. And there were people who were heads of these departments. So it wasn't you know, an anarchist uh, uh, attempt at uh, direct democracy. Now, a myth, a very common myth, and it's one that Marx wrote about, was that members of the commune were paid a workman's wages. It's in the Civil War in France. And I wrote about this in an article that, you know, when I put down like all the, the, you know, the most impressive feats of the commune, and a friend of mine, a lifelong Trotskyist in, uh, in Britain, so not somebody who had any anti-commune art sentiments, said he had just read a new book on Leo Frankel, one of the important commune arts that had just been published. And he said, that's not the case. And so what I did was I went to the minutes, which you can find online, of every sitting of the commune. And sure enough, the, uh, the members of the commune received three times a workman's wages. They didn't receive a workman's wages. And nor was there a limitation on the earnings of, uh, of people who weren't sitting on the commune to this low salary, because the highest salary uh, that was allowed was 6,000 francs uh, a year, which was 1,500 francs more than the average workman made. So, uh, so they, they, they weren't paid the same as a, a worker working in a factory which also led me to look at how many people were working in factories. And because we think of the Paris Commune as being the industrial working class taking power for the first time. Except there was no industrial working class in Paris. 90% of the workers in Paris worked in enterprises of 10 or fewer uh, employees. So the industrial working class was not quite, had not quite formed uh, in Paris. So in a sense, and this goes back to the French Revolution, the people who made the Paris Commune, who fought for it, who died for it, were the sans culottes, the same as the sans culottes of the French Revolution. People, artisans, people who worked in, uh, in small shops were the ones who, 
who made the revolution. Now, amongst their, uh, something that I found really revealing was that the, um, uh, another one of its great accomplishments was they banned night work for bakers, which I think is a, a, a fabulously French uh, thing to make a, a top priority. And in fact, Leo Frankel, the, a member of the commune, a Jewish uh, uh, exile from Hungary, had said it was this, the greatest socialist measure that the commune had, uh, had implemented. Except it's not so certain that it really was implemented because it was debated heatedly and finally only went into effect on May 5th. And the commune was, uh, was wiped out on May 28th was, was its last day. So if it went into effect, uh, it didn't go into effect. It wasn't in effect for very long. And in the debate about it, it was really revealing of the feelings of the members of the commune that they said in these debates, there were, there were members of the commune who said, it's not when the, the argument came up about uh, allowing workers not to have to work at night and they, they could be able to start at five in the morning or six in the morning, that uh, the, there were members of the commune who said, it's not our job to interfere in a dispute between workers and bosses, which I thought was like an absolutely shocking argument to find a commune art saying, but it's in the minutes of the commune. Um, so, you know, all you have to do, if you could find the minutes, put in the word boulanger, and you'll follow every argument about the bakers, and there it is. And in fact, the bakers had no right, had previously had no right to form a union. The commune didn't give them that right. So it would have been individual bakers against individual bakery workers against individual bakers. Okay. Uh, and then there were a number of other measures, which... Uh, which really were, tr were truly impressive. For example, uh, something that was implemented, uh, what we wanted implemented during the pandemic was the suspension of rent payments. And that did indeed, the, the commune absolutely passed the measure uh, suspending rent payments for, uh, for three months. And so there's no arguing that that's a, a pretty extraordinary measure, but it was, however, a continuation of something that had done by the previous government. So uh, it was an important measure. It was one that was needed for Parisians who've been under siege uh, by the Prussians and now are being attacked. But it was a continuation of uh, what had gone on before. Same thing with uh, pawn shops. The pawn shops were a key part of the social welfare system in, in France. And they passed the measure of the commune granting uh, the right to, with, to get every, uh, reclaim items for free that were 20 francs or it went back and forth, 20 or 30 francs. But this too had actually been implemented by the government of national defense. Okay, uh, workshops, they passed the measure that any workshops abandoned by their owners would be turned over to the workers. And the workers, the, 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 there was no Bakuninist style anarchism in France yet. So the, the only form of anarchism there was was uh, with followers of Proudhon, and this is who the members of the commune were. And uh, so there were some shops that were turned over to their workers. But if you read what the workers had to say, or the people who ran those factories had to say about uh, taking over the factories, it was also pretty, sh pretty, sh pretty frightening. A member of the commune said, you know, communism is a joke and it's not up to people who work to support those who lay around and do nothing. It's in the debates of the commune. I mean, it's, it's going through the, uh, the debates is quite uh, a revealing and surprising uh, experience. Now, Socialism was one of the, it was uh, something that often was discussed and they considered themselves socialists. It's absolutely no question. But their notion of what socialism was is not necessarily ours. And one of their most famous acts was the tearing down of the Vendome column, which was a column in Paris that was built out of cannons captured by Napoleon the firsts. Um, armies during the wars, and it was considered uh, a symbol of militarism, imperialism, all that was worse in France. 
And so the Arts Commission, led by Gustave Corbet, was given the assignment of tearing down the Vendome Column. And if you go online, the pictures of it are fabulous. Is all the, uh, the workers in their uh, National Guard uniform standing by the broken pieces of the column. But they didn't tear down the column. They paid a private contracting firm to tear it down. Uh, and Corbet, interestingly enough, after the commune was crushed, when he was put on trial for this act and was uh, made to, to pay out of his own pocket for, the, for its replacement, did not take a necessarily heroic stand. He, he claimed he had nothing to do with it. It was somebody else's decision. You know, it was kind of like the Bears in the Gary Larson uh, cartoon. Also, if you've seen the, um, you know, the commune had these fabulous red banners, the different units of the commune had fabulous red banners that uh, I'd always assumed had been stitched together by the people of the various the, the families of the rail, of the people in the national units. In fact, it was a carpet factory that had the contract to uh, to make the red flags for the commune. One of uh, one of those flags was uh, with the decades was in Lenin's tomb. Uh, okay, another another of its uh, the last maybe uh, Mitchell. Sorry, the last one. Okay, time. okay. So, and so so finally. The, uh, I just want to very quickly talk about, uh, again, presentism, where we people have, have said that the commune was a great feminist revolt. And women played uh, a really important role, Louise Michel, more importantly, Elizabeth Dmitriev, who was um, Marx's delegate to Paris. But in fact, you know, the commune never gave women the vote. And although they did give pensions to, uh, the widows of, I'm sorry, the, the, that if, if, if in a couple wasn't married, if the, if the male was killed in fighting, then his, the, the woman he lived with was given a, a widow's pension, but women were not armed. And so, and feminism, if you, again, if you read all the, the documents of the commune arts was not uh, really a priority of theirs. Now, this sounds like a terrible, terrible, terrible critique of the commune, but the fact is, they did what they could in the situation, just like the, the French revolutionaries in Jean Jaurès's history, the, the uh, socialist history of the French Revolution, they were, as Magali said, breaking entirely new ground. And they were products of their time and of their place. And that, they, that we might not be able to imitate everything they did because it just doesn't fit. But nevertheless, you know, their heroism and also the fact that they're living in only 72 days, they weren't able to disappoint many people. They still uh, set an admirable, if mythical, uh, example. Thank you. Thank you, Mitchell. It's, uh, so you begin this uh, debate with a lot of, uh, uh, lots of uh, contradictions uh, within the commune to that maybe would uh, give place to a great debate afterwards. Um, I have, for sure, I have a lot of, uh, of things to say, but I will stay at my, at my place now. Uh, but, but I have to mention also that uh, beyond the, the myth you described and, and probably the contradictions uh, due uh, that mainly are due to the limitation in time, uh, uh, the, the, the commune has a specific meaning in terms of living democracy, you know, and uh, the unions, the corporations, the clubs, uh, the women's union, uh, democracy with the cooperatives, the mutuals, democracy were, was uh, much more than the structure of the Paris Council. Right. It was a lot of uh, self-organization. Um, and so maybe, Dimitri, you can now uh, let us know a little bit about what the meaning of this institu institutionalization, this new institutionalization for democracy uh, that uh, is reflected in the Paris Commune, please. Thank you, Magali, for setting the stage for what I'm about to say. Uh, and um, I have to say that what Mitch, what Mitch put forward um, is of interest uh, 
and should be looked at carefully, but there are things that uh, he asserted with, with which the evidence that I have researched uh, does not concur with some of his opinions and some of his analysis. Um, as far as I understand from what I have learned from studying the uh, Paris Commune, it is without a doubt the most important urban revolution in history. And we have to understand why it is so important. Uh, without repeating anything uh, of, uh, of an obvious nature that Mitch himself has underlined, we have to recognize that um, the National Guard, for instance, which started out to be on a class basis quite different than what it became, it really became a working class instrument in the course of um, the Paris Commune. Um, it introduced certain direct democratic elements in the structure of the National Guard. For example, um, the principle of recall, uh, the principle of the difference between what an officer is paid and what an ordinary member of the National Guard is paid. I mean, these were new radical propositions that you can recall an officer if you don't agree with an officer, given the discussion that would take place in your unit of the National Guard. So that in itself was an element, a very important element of direct democracy, which itself was reflected in the commune as a whole and in the city council as, as, as a whole. So uh, when we look at the structure of what happened was keep in mind that Paris was completely surrounded both with the national army coming out of, of Versailles, ready to, 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 to come in and, and to take over. The Prussians were still uh, on the horizon. And within this besieged city of almost 2 million people, the second largest city in Europe, what did they do? They declared themselves as a commune. As a matter of fact, the Parisian communards refused to consider themselves any longer as the national capital of France. They opened up the city to all non-French citizens, an act of internationalism without precedence. So all of a sudden, Algerians, Moroccans, Hungarians, Poles became equal members of the commune and they rolled up their sleeves and participated as uh, communards. They were very welcomed. And that form of internationalism is not to be uh, minimized. Uh, there was a slogan that emerged during the, uh, during the Paris Commune. It was, our flag is the flag of the universal social republic. Our flag, is the flag of the universal social republic. And they encouraged other communes to take place, not only throughout France, and some of them did, but throughout Europe and throughout the world. Um, now, the National Guard was a very important element, but it was one of several other important elements. Remember that Paris had 20 arrondissements, 20 boroughs, and within many of those boroughs, some more important than others, there were revolutionary clubs, all sorts of revolutionary clubs, clubs that leaned towards Proudhon and anarchism, clubs that leaned towards uh, the First International. And by the way, the First International had 50,000 members in Paris, not a small number. Uh, and these revolutionary clubs were sort of kernels of activism, constant debate, constant activism, constantly taking initiatives. I mean, all you have to do is look at the famous uh, six hour film, <laughs> which I welcome you to do. It's a real challenge uh, on the Paris Commune and to hear all the discussions, all the debates, women, men, children, everybody was involved in these discussions. 
It was a really living experience. And uh, uh, the, the idea that uh, of this internationalism, and as a matter of fact, one of the accomplishments of the Paris Commune is to take Paris, the whole experience out of the national myth of la grand France, le grand, la, la grand, le grand pays, etc. Uh, and, to, and to concentrate on the neighborhoods, on the arrondissements, and these revolutionary clubs and everything that took place within them and between each other uh, was really the fabric of the new Paris, of the new commune. And that's what we, that's what we really have to understand and, and appreciate. There was a real grassroots uh, emergence from below. And when uh, they had the elections for uh, the city council, so there was a council uh, and there were people who were not comfortable with thinking or acting about Paris as a city council above what was happening in the arrondissement. So some of them quit and they had by-elections in April. And when the by-elections took place and all the debate that took place around the by-elections, many of the people said, we have to really respect what is happening in the arrondissements. And we have to federate what is taking place in the arrondissements together uh, and to be sort of a parallel power, a dual power with what is happening at Hotel de Ville. This was very important. Uh, these were really significant threads that go back to the second French Revolution of 1792 and 93. That thread was picked up in history and uh, re-emerged in the Paris Commune. Uh, I don't want to repeat some of the things that uh, Mitch said, but uh, I do want to say that women in uh, the Paris Commune played an extremely important role, but they also ex ex played a very important role uh, militarily. They were armed. When Louise Michel walked up to Montmartre to prevent the cannons from being seized by the armies of Versailles, she was carrying a rifle. And although no violence took place because the soldiers turned against their general and joined the communards, it doesn't mean that women were not there ready to fight and to fight with arms if necessary. Uh, so they played an extremely important role in every sense of the word. And we have to uh, then say that within the short history of the commune, some extraordinary things were, were ac accomplished. For example, uh, the death penalty had already been abolished. Uh, the separation of church and state took place. Uh, rents owed for the duration of the city siege were abolished. And they even went back to October of 1870. Uh, child labor and night labor was abolished. The dissolution of the standing army was introduced. No professional army anymore. There was the National Guard and that's it, that's all. There was free public education for everybody. Uh, and, uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, abandoned factories were taken over by, by workers. So they established the principle of worker control cooperatives and they seized and redistributed all empty houses that people, to people who needed housing. And they, they banned punitive fines and the docking of wages and salaries. And they established something very important. They established fixed prices for bread. Uh, and they postponed uh, commercial debt, all commercial debt obligations, and so on and so forth. So again, of the 72 days of the Paris Commune, we have to remember, uh, Hotel de Ville only met for 60 days. And within 60 days, they introduced some of these uh, incredible reforms. And I'm reminding everybody that this is 1871, not the 20th century. 1871, and they introduced these remarkable measures. Um, 
So in effect, this federation of workers committees, this federation of committees within the arrondissements, this growing interaction between the revolutionary clubs in all of the arrondissements uh, created an ethos in, um, in Paris, which really alarmed the ruling classes throughout Europe and worried a great deal uh, the uh, Versailles government, which of course received direct support from um, what was happening outside of Paris and outside of France. I mean, the Prussians gave them help and other uh, reactionary forces gave them help and so on and so forth. And I just want to conclude because I do want to give the opportunity of others to really, uh, to really say what they have uh, in the discussion. I just want to say that uh, at the very end, all of this experience was really taken into account, especially in the famous uh, saint Emir Congress in 1872. That is to say, all the exiles that left France. Uh, and they went through their experience systematically and they wrote and talked about these experiences. And so it's important for us not to think about what Marx said and he did not say, or what Bakunin said, or he did not say, what Kropotkin said and did not say. We have to go to the record and see what people who live the experience uh, felt in that period. And one of the most remarkable people who lived through all of that was of course, Louise Michel, who was sent into exile. She went to New Caledonia, a, a, a punitive and a very tough penal colony in, uh, in the Pacific. And even there, even though she, she was imprisoned under very difficult circumstances, being an organizer, she helped organize the local people who lived there, by the way, <laughs> very interesting. Anyway, she came back from exile and uh, she wound up in both London and Paris and constantly speaking on various engagements. But in the end, uh, she was not in good health. And on January 9th, 1905, she died. And as she was dying, she was saying, I think that the next revolution will take place in Russia. And in 1905, that's exactly what took place. The revolution broke out in, in Russia, as you remember. Uh, and her body was brought back to Paris. And would you believe that 300,000, 300,000 citizens actually came out for her funeral. And um, the, the streets were just inundated with people. It was the biggest funeral since the death of Victor Hugo. I just wanna say that in the end, two things I conclude. When I read volume two of Murray Bookchin's Third Revolution, a monumental work in three volumes called The Third Revolution. In volume two, he says, the Paris Commune was the closest we got to implementing libertarian municipalism. That's, that's significant for him to have said that. And what is also significant is when I read the works of Abdalan Ocalan and the Kurdish freedom movement, I also see a connection with what happens on the ground in the Paris Commune and democratic confederalism. So these ideas, whether they're myth or real, or whether they're verifiable by the most minute historical research, these myths, as Mitch said, are living, enduring, and they have to be built upon as we try to reconstruct urban society. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dimitri, for this very inspiring um, speech, which is, I think, very uh, uh, promising for the next uh, debates to come. And you made a very perfect transition with uh, Anna Corouache. Uh, mentioning or challenge work on Paris Commune and and please uh, Anna uh, can you tell us uh, what is 
the links you can make between uh, Paris Commune and, and uh, democratic confederalism going on currently in, in Rojava. Thank you. Okay. First, I would like to express my greetings to all of you from here and from the friends of the Genealogy Academy here in Rojava. Um, uh, and also, I would like to commemorate really all the brave uh, women and men that sacrificed their lives uh, on the barricades and uh, to fight for a life and freedom and dignity uh, 150 years ago and who are still continuing to do so uh, today. Um, so, um, like the links there, actually, the deeper you look, uh, the more links uh, and parallels uh, you can find. But uh, I think it's also important uh, to see, um, to learn from the lessons uh, that have been uh, made. Uh, and um, I think like, even if we start to look at the conditions under which uh, the Paris Commune uh, appeared, and of course the Paris Commune did not happen all at once, did not fall from the sky, but there have been um, social uh, organ organizing uh, processes, there have been uh, people's uh, uprisings in uh, 1848, uh, and uh, there has been uh, the history or the, yeah, the connection to uh, former revolts and, uh, and lessons that were le learned from it. Um, so I think also for the Rojava revolution, it's very important to see uh, that it didn't only start in uh, 2011 uh, or uh, like with the declaration uh, of the democratic autonomy in uh, 2012, but uh, that there has have been uh, three decades of clandestine uh, people's uh, organization and autonomous women's organizing uh, in the framework of the Kurdistan uh, liberation struggle in uh, Rojava, uh, in uh, the Middle East, in all four parts uh, of Kurdistan. And this has been uh, the foundation uh, on which um, it was possible then, when together with the People's Spring, which is often called also Arab Spring, but we prefer to call it People's Spring because it was not only Arab people that rose up against dictatorial uh, regimes uh, in uh, 2011. So when uh, in a situation where central government nation states uh, were weakened, um, people that were organized uh, had the opportunity uh, to take over, um, I wouldn't say power, but to, uh, to build up a system uh, that uh, could replace um, uh, hierarchical structures uh, with uh, new forms of um, uh, organizing lives and politics, uh, economies and organizing self-defense. So um, often it is like the question, what happened after the uprisings uh, 2011 up, uh, in Tunisia, in Egypt, did it bring any better or did the situation become worse? But um, there we can really clearly see uh, how important it is uh, to have to build up an organizational uh, basis and to have a clear uh, focus also uh, what are you organizing for what kind of uh, society what kind of uh, uh, you want to, you want to live in and there in this context uh, the concepts of uh, democratic uh, autonomy democratic nation democratic confederalism uh, that were um, uh, described by Abdullah Öcalan in his defense writings really uh, made uh, a very big uh, impact and they were discussed in society before so that there was a, a perspective of that um, in a situation of an uprising or in the situation where it's the possibility for the first time for Kurdish people to um, uh, to have a, a situation of self-determination. It's not about uh, destroying the state and replacing it with a new state-like um, structures, but um, that, is, that it, it needs uh, a different um, approach uh, in sense of um, yeah, people-based uh, democracy. Um, and um, in this context, uh, on one hand, uh, there has been uh, the traditions of uh, um, yeah, 
organizing clandestinely uh, people's committees uh, from culture and arts, uh, which was also uh, a crime under, or still a crime like to uh, make Kurdish arts and culture under the Ba'ath regime, uh, until um, uh, solidarity um, in the neighborhood uh, social structures that um, are, were not based on, or were not state related because the state by itself uh, was uh, in making hostilities towards uh, the people. So in this context also, um, when uh, on the um, 19th uh, July 2012 at first in Kobani and then also in the other regions of Rojava, people stood up to get out uh, the uh, Syrian state uh, uh, authorities um, of uh, their places. Even before this, um, neighborhood committees had been established. Uh, women had built up uh, women's uh, centers uh, to ensure um, uh, or to support uh, one another in situations of uh, violence, in situations of um, uh, yeah, where, where, where you needed support. Um, and uh, also in these uprisings, uh, and uh, like uh, we've talked with many women that uh, said uh, in some of the cities, it was the women who went in front of the um, uh, military posts of the Syrian armies and uh, sat down there until uh, they would in the end withdraw and or went into, uh, into the police stations and so after that, and this is, I think, also a parallel with, with the commune, after uh, the uh, state was forced to withdraw, um, the former government places that were uh, a sign of, um, let's say, um, torture or oppression uh, were taken over uh, or were transformed into um, uh, neighborhood uh, council houses uh, into um, Malajin, like women's uh, houses, uh, into um, parts of um, yeah where people's councils uh, would meet. Uh, so actually, the places of state uh, authority were replaced with um, um, uh, yeah with um, people's direct uh, democracy uh, structures. Um, like the very um, um, uh, basic um, organization, uh, organizational structures um, uh, that were built up in the process and even started uh, before, as I already said, was uh, to um, uh, to organize uh, on one hand councils and communes, to organize uh, people's academies and women's academies. Uh, cooperatives uh, and also self-defense uh, units uh, because uh, it, like the situation in the Middle East and uh, that there would be repression uh, by the Syrian regime as well as uh, from other armed forces as we saw then later with uh, uh, Daesh uh, attacking uh, like the region. Oh, our electricity is back. Um, so we saw that the revolution light came. <laughs> um, uh, no, um, but what is I think important, um, uh, people came together and worked out um, a social contract uh, uh, where the like basic principles uh, uh, were um, uh, defined in uh, and the experiment or the um, yeah, the approach of a democratic nation uh, or, and democratic autonomy means also that it is not a, just a Kurdish project as is, is often uh, introduced uh, uh, in, in, the, in the public, but the experiences of the Kurdish uh, liberation movement and the Kurdish women's movement played a very, very important role in um, encouraging and insp inspiring this process uh, and uh, also um, like in sense of uh, yeah dedicating uh, themselves uh, to, uh, to defend this revolution but um, at the same time uh, people from all the different um, uh, 
uh, yeah, national groups, religious groups um, uh, from Arabs, um, Armenians, uh, Syrians, uh, Turkmen, uh, Chechen, like all the different uh, uh, people, uh, Yazidis, Muslims, Christians, together took uh, place in it. And it was also a process of getting to know one another because the division that was made by uh, the nationalism of the Syrian state <clears throat> really uh, created also uh, gaps or mistrust in the communities. Uh, so uh, although it was never uh, really uh, a very uh, nationalist um, uh, attitude uh, inside the, the population, but uh, stirred up by the state, there were groups uh, that uh, also um, encouraged uh, nationalist programs, as we saw in Kamishlu in 2004, which actually was the first uprising of the Kurdish people also ag against um, the um, Arabic uh, Syrian state uh, uh, nationalism, and uh, which I think the, the events that later on happened, it was also something like uh, regaining the self-confidence or regaining uh, uh, the, an own identity and uh, seeing that uh, with if people are organized and uh, decided, uh, they don't have to be afraid, but they can confront even uh, militarist uh, attacks. Um, and But that, uh, there's also a need for organizing uh, self-defense. So from that point onwards, um, like many uh, different uh, steps uh, were made uh, and uh, like before in January 2014, the democratic autonomy was uh, announced in the three cantons of uh, uh, Gizre, uh, Afrin and Kobane. Um, and then a pro the process, the three cantons were quite uh, disconnected from one another because there were um, uh, jihadist uh, groups in, in between. There were the attacks of Daesh, as you know, the uh, attacks uh, on, on Kobani and the resistance in, in Kobani that happened in uh, 2014 when also the international community became aware and a very strong solidarity uh, was uh, the basis of uh, this victory of the women's defense groups and the people's defense groups uh, uh, in, to defend Kobani. And then from then onwards, um, it was really the question of how to make it possible that the three cantons can be uh, connected, how, what are the things, uh, what uh, decisions need to be taken on local levels, what decisions are uh, are a consensus uh, for uh, all three uh, cantons. Um, and at the same time, also to see uh, that there's still this threat of uh, Daesh uh, and that there's also at the same time, when, while uh, Mimbej, Raqqa, like many of the places where uh, uh, in, in the region uh, uh, were occupied by Daesh. So, um, I think one thing that we saw with the Paris Commune, because Paris was isolated and there wasn't a very huge resistance outside that could overcome uh, the blockade and the attacks of the um, uh, of the Versailles army, um, it uh, it was uh, in a uh, totally un encycled and uh, in mil military sense, but also I think in in political uh, sense, maybe there wasn't any internet at the time, it was not so easy to get uh, the world uh, moving and uh, to stand up uh, as it is maybe now, but I think um, uh, many, uh, or if we think of how to defend uh, revolutionary gains, uh, it is very important uh, to see that each uprising that happens uh, somewhere and that forces um, the um, uh, yeah, that forces um, the states to um, uh, yeah, to uh, to uh, to stop the the attacks um, is very meaningful. And so I think um, one of the important things also that happened after uh, the successful defense uh, of Kobani was not uh, just to leave it like this, but to think of a bigger uh, and not also to see democratic autonomy as a project of the of the Kurds uh, because one more also the different uh, commune uh, communities 
um, we gain the, con gain the confidence that it is possible to work together, uh, that it is possible to uh, build up a system of self-administration, that although they are very small supplies, uh, we can organize a health system, we can organize uh, a school system in another language, uh, we can uh, organize uh, food supplies. Uh, we also, all, with all the restrictions, the embargo and the tax that they are, uh, it is possible to organize our lives in a different way. And the land that was uh, um, like, uh, um, uh, like the, the state took out of the hands of, of the people and uh, used for big mono, monoculture uh, um, grain uh, production. Um, instead of doing away of um, uh, agriculture that is harming uh, the land and uh, is not fulfilling the, the many-sided needs of, of the people, we can uh, redistribute the land, we can build up uh, cooperatives, we can plant also something else than grain for the whole of Syria, but uh, we can also put on uh, small gardens, like all these restrictions that were made, uh, or put on people's uh, um, possibility to take decisions. Uh, maybe it wasn't even possible for uh, uh, a family to plant a tree in the way in the place that they wanted because uh, it was uh, like it would have needed water to in order to get water you need to dig a well and the state wouldn't give you any allowance to dig a well uh, and all these kind of uh, restrictions uh, that uh, people uh, uh, did not make people decide upon uh, even what they would plant in their backyard uh, or in the garden um, they were lifted and so this uh, also um, gave the possibility to uh, yeah to create new things to build uh, new things up um, and then with 2014 onwards I think uh, a very important uh, thing uh, that also was then um, was uh, that the women's defense forces and the uh, and uh, uh, and the democratic um, autonomy um, uh, administration uh, also uh, decided on uh, we have we cannot only liberate our own homes we have also responsibility for the people in other parts of Syria so uh, to liberate uh, Mimbit, Raqqa, uh, Deir Azor, uh, Tabqa uh, from uh, the terror of, of Daesh uh, and make people coming uh, yeah breathe again uh, that was also an important step um, but of course we know that uh, Turkey and other forces were not not happy about it so the attacks on Afrin started the occupation that is still going on uh, then later on uh, like in 2019 uh, Serekani and uh, Girisipi were attacked and are still occupied so we see that like on one hand, there's this building up process, and on but on the other hand, it's uh, still we see that in many uh, ways uh, the gains are uh, under under attack and threat. But we also see that um, many important uh, changes happen in society. Um, for instance, like uh, we ask women, what does this revolution for mean? What actually has changed uh, in your lives? And we ask women from all uh, generations uh, and uh, I just want to give the example of one mom uh, from Kobani she said uh, uh, like before the revolution um, I was uh, locked up in my home and I could never decide what kind of clothes I would wear my husband would go to into town and would get uh, some uh, cloth and then I would have to make my clothes uh, out of the cloth that he chose but today, uh, I go together with my neighbors uh, into town. I have my own money because I'm uh, working in uh, one of the women's institutions. And I choose the cloth that I like and I can afford and uh, I make my own models. Um, and I don't have to put on uh, the heavy anymore, like the black uh, veal. Um, if I want, I do it. If, if not, I don't. Uh, so. Maybe it's a small example, but um, like uh, this 
experience of uh, being able to uh, make decisions to um, express uh, your will your needs and also to have now uh, some uh, possibilities in sense of uh, that in, that the women's uh, like together with the women's movement uh, women's cooperatives have been established that gives uh, women the uh, possibility to have an income uh, that um, like the academies uh, also like one part of it are the works of genealogy like to uh, have collective processes of learning from one another and uh, to analyze the situation and what is needed so one result for instance was that in 2014 the women's uh, movement said we need something like uh, women's laws like principles um, that uh, are valid uh, for 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 everyone it's not only about supporting women that are seeking for uh, support uh, at the women's centers but um, we have we need to have uh, principles like that uh, traditional customs like uh, marriage under of underaged uh, um, uh, young people uh, gives harm to both uh, boys and girls um, then uh, like the polygamy like uh, marriage of a man with more than than one uh, woman uh, which uh, makes creates competition uh, between women and uh, is a big pain for for the women as well as for the children who are played off against uh, one another uh, so uh, to to make it have a ban on uh, poly polygam uh, marriages um, then um, uh, like uh, to have a bright price and this makes brings women in a situation of being uh, a commodity that is uh, sold so all these kinds of things were made uh, issues of discussions and uh, the women's movement uh, after having discussed all these issues what are really uh, things uh, that prevent women from being um, uh, equal part of society and for expressing uh, themselves uh, to uh, and to protect their dignity uh, women took the um, formulated uh, the kinds of principles and then they were afterwards also adopted uh, by uh, the general assembly of the democratic uh, autonomy and then uh, this means uh, they are they are valid uh, standards but of course we know only publishing a law does not make uh, all these changes happen all at once and not everybody just because something is forbidden does not do it anymore so still of course uh, there's uh, also patriarchal violence uh, cases of uh, this kind of customs that uh, were uh, banned uh, are still happening but at the same time there's also an organized struggle going on and also with the education processes, both in the women's academies as well as in the general academies, we see really that um, some changes happens in these things that it is not an honor anymore for a man to say I have three wives as it was before, but now that they more, uh, it was I married before the revolution so um, yeah this is how it was at that time, we didn't have this conscience or things like this uh, happen. Uh, women that uh, tell us were like after their husband uh, went to uh, some of the educations, uh, the, the standard uh, like popular education programs, for instance, women's history or genealogy are also uh, lessons that everybody participates to. So uh, women tell us after uh, participating to these kind of lessons, when the husbands come home, uh, there are some changes in in in. Uh, in the family life that, uh, that the work they do get more respected uh, or uh, that for the first time men became aware of uh, how much work a woman is doing each day or also asking uh, for a women's opinion so maybe we cannot say that it uh, or also like with a, a thing of myth and reality um i this these stories are not myth but it's also not the reality of the all over society. So, of course, you ha can have uh, families where the patriarchal dominance and pressure are much stronger. But and on the other hand, you have others that really try to um, 
adapt alternatives and also young men that say, I don't want to play the role, same roles as my father did. And also you have young women that uh, say, I don't want uh, this kind of uh, family or marriage uh, that my mother lived uh, through and decide uh, for either uh, joining Yepeje or for um, living in uh, women only structures or the women's village uh, genre. So there are uh, more and more young people that are look, looking for also for, for alternatives. And I think, um, this is something very important, like to see a revolution or a re is nothing uh, that starts just at the uh, at the date where the uprising is as uh, like for the uh, Paris uh, Commune, it was not only the 18th of March or for the Ruja revolution, uh, it's not only the 19th of July um, 2012, but you have uh, something that built up uh, the, uh, the basis uh, in sense of the ideas, uh, in sense of the aspirations uh, that people have uh, and uh, the level of organizing. Um, and then of course it needs a, a cert certain circumstances also that, uh, yeah, in, in which you can make this uh, physical change um, happening. Um, and you need to evaluate them. If you're not organized, you cannot evaluate these kind of historical moments. But uh, yeah, it's also not like this part or, or this point is not the, the point where you can change everything all at once. Uh, and it's a process with every step that you make, you realize uh, that there are other shortcomings and uh, you have to reflect again. So also the process of building up the structures of the communes, of the people's councils. Um, it's still also something that is um, uh, elaborated or reflected upon and changes are made. Uh, so for instance, uh, during the last uh, two years, there were discussions of people's assemblies where we said uh, it was, um, the result of it was that the uh, role of the communes has to be stronger, not only the people's councils on uh, district levels or on regional levels, but that actually the communes, which means uh, the villages, uh, the neighborhoods uh, uh, in the in the towns, uh, that there um, much more activity uh, activity is needed, and it's not only a place of. Uh, uh, distributing uh, the gas and distributing uh, the bread and um, uh, organizing um, like formal formalities, but at the same time uh, that communes are really have uh, this also this component more of being social life, being a place of discussion, uh, getting involved and find to how to find solution for the big problems that we are facing at the moment. And I just want to, in the end, uh, to yeah, give. Please. One example <laughs> from the last week, which I think is very important um, because um, due to the uh, embargo and uh, the US uh, financial policies uh, that are made uh, on, on Syria, uh, the rise of the dollar really caused big poverty. In addition to this, there's, uh, we had, didn't have any rain this uh, spring. So the agriculture, which is uh, the main source of life and income, um, I think about 80% of the harvest this year died, dried out. So uh, this is a very difficult situation. And also many things uh, need to come from outside because for instance, there's no cooking gas available here. This needs to come from Iraq or South Kurdistan. Uh, uh, and it gets more and more expensive because the dollar gets more and more expensive. And so uh, the... Um, uh, democratic uh, autonomy uh, um, administration uh, published a, a decree that uh, the prices for, uh, for gas and uh, petrol uh, would be would become higher. But then the people stood up against this. They, in the communes, there were critics. Uh, also, some uh, like peaceful protest happened and said, "We cannot afford at this time. We don't have any income from our harvest. We don't have." Uh, like the prices are rising due to the to the dollar uh, situation, and so uh, we cannot afford uh, to pay higher prices for cooking gas or for 
for petrol, which is needed to make the water pumps working. So uh, within three days, uh, the um, Democratic Autonomy uh, Administration uh, reconsidered and withdraw this uh, um, decision and said, okay, um, if the people are not content with the decision that we made, uh, thinking of how we can uh, manage the situation, then uh, if the people are standing up against us, we cannot do this because we are uh, we don't have any um, um, like uh, we should be the voice of the people not uh, acting uh, against their will. So now uh, it will be a process that at first uh, again in the communes uh, there will be discussions on how uh, this uh, difficult economical financial uh, situation can be solved, uh, how, uh, what can be the resources, how resources can, uh, that are available <coughs> can be shared, uh, and uh, how other solutions can be made without hiring, let's say, uh, the, the price for cooking gas uh, within a, for a high amount within a very short time. So um, <coughs> my time is over, I know. <laughs> There would be many more other stories to tell, but I think uh, it's very important uh, mm. to see that it's a process of struggles and the, but the important thing of also what is the lesson of the Paris Commune, um, that on one hand, it's important to be organized, uh, uh, to create unity within uh, society uh, and on the uh, uh, spread uh, this uh, also the gains uh, and and the hopes uh, internationally um, and to, yeah to to include and uh, and to spread this uh, spirit and inspire others uh, to do the same and one of this is um, yeah continuing today in Rojava we can say. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, this is uh, very interesting, and uh, and I think we will have the opportunity to ask you lots of questions because uh, we want probably to know more. Uh, you mentioned uh, the the, the self confidence uh, in this empowering process of uh, making the Rojava's revolution. Uh, this is you mentioned the, how much people and and women in particular have have developed their self confidence. Uh, in this process, and and I would like to say that it's also a confidence in for the the all of us um, to to know that uh, in 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 Rojava there is this this ongoing process. I think it gives hopes hope for for lots of us um, ev everywhere in the world. So thank you for mentioning the the affiliation with the commune and probably they will have more questions. I will now give the speech to the last speaker who is uh, Theo Rouette and uh, Theo Rouette will, um, will uh, go back to France uh, now and uh, explaining also the affiliation uh, between the Paris commune and, and current mobilization now in, in France. You have the speech Theo. <coughs> Thank you, thank you very much. Um, very happy to be here to, to close this panel. So yeah, my name is Theo. I'm a French ecologist and, and activist as well as a member of the Transnational Institute of Social Ecology. Um, so yeah, like, like many others here, I guess that I think that uh, the ideas of, of Bookshin and Nochalan are very important today uh, because they offer a radical critique of, of what is right now an utopian vision for the future and a, and a practical path to achieve it. And um, I think that the Paris Commune, uh, we can disagree on many aspects. I think we can all agree that it's, it's been <clears throat> a major influence for, uh, for the ideas, the intellectual development of the people that helped to build uh, social ecology, such as the anarchist communism of, of Recluse and Kropotkin, and also the other type of communism. I, I'm obviously talking about Marxism. No? So, social ecologists and, and radical activists, I think uh, they owe a huge debt to the, to the commune uh, because it has shown how international solidarity, uh, as well as a focus on the local communal democracy can complement each other. And I think it's very strongly actualized in, in Rojava right now. So indeed, now right now we will go back to France, uh, seeing a little bit how the radical municipalist movement has emerged uh, in the recent years. So this talk will uh, present these developments and 
while looking at some of the parallels we can make and the lessons we can uh, take from the, the commune for activism today. So we will focus on mostly the recent events. We could go on and on about talking about May 68 or the ZADs in France, but uh, my point of departure for this speech will actually be the, the Yellow Vest movement itself uh, in 2018. So this movement is marked in a, in a context of a deep anti-establishment feeling against politicians in France in general. And it erupted in November 2018 um, against the tax where uh, more than 2000 blockage uh, erupted spontaneously all over the country it was probably more. That happened mostly in the rural areas where people are more dependent on the car. Uh, what is striking about this, uh, this movement and why uh, it's relevant for our discussion of the commune is that the, its organization was marked by the ethos of radical horizontality that we can also find in the recent uh, occupation movements like, again, the Occupy or the ZAD or the Indigenous the, in Spain. So the, the, it, took, it uh, materialized in gatherings on roundabouts uh, where people recreated the sense of, of solidarity, of mutual support, and also of what uh, Anna just mentioned, this sense of uh, self-confidence in, in doing politics. No? So like, a bit like in the commune where we had meetings in churches of uh, revolutionary clubs, we can see that the, the Yellow Vest movement reappropriated public spaces, uh, vacant buildings to create what they called uh, people's houses, the Maison du Peuple. So they became kind of small republics where people re-engaged with the uh, political uh, process itself, the authentic one. Um, and like in the commune, the agent was not so much the worker in itself as much as the, the citizen. It's actually verified by the profile of the protesters and of the, the, the communards. We, we can talk about this a bit more later. But one important difference, I think that it's, uh, that is relevant here is that uh, it, the Yellow Vest cannot be classified again as an urban struggle. It, uh, started in the very rural world. So unless the commune that ended up quite isolated, an isolated urban island in the midst of, of, the, of, of France in Paris. So the striking development of the Yellow Vest movement is actually the development of its libertarian branch. Um, so in the midst of the movement, there's a small commune in the Northeast that's called Commercy that was quite heavily influenced by Bookshins and Castoriadis ideas on direct democracy. That, um, that organized themselves in popular assemblies. Um, and they called very early in the movement for the establishment of local assemblies throughout the country. Uh, this call has given them quite, has had quite a bit of resonance. And they called for the federation of Yellow Vest assemblies throughout the country. Uh, I quote the last bit of the call, let's create the assembly of assemblies, the commune of communes. This is the meaning of history. This is our proposal. And that's exactly what they've done. Uh, they organized the first assembly of assemblies of the movement. So what is interesting with this assembly is that it was really made, um, it was made of revocable delegates with the uh, imperative mandates from 75 um, local Yellow Vest groups. Um, and they received the support of libertarian movements, <clears throat> including the Zapatistas and, and the Kurds. So since the first one that took place in January 2019, uh, there's been six more of these uh, Assembly of Assemblies. And one is coming back after the COVID uh, in June in Paris this year. So it survived the, the crisis. Um, the other main development was the Commune of Commune. This time, this, the initiative was open to any municipalist groups, any group that define themselves as supportive of free communes in France. Uh, so it took place one year later, uh, in two, January 2020. And this also is coming back in France uh, this year in October. So again, like uh, these, these structures have, uh, have, uh, are really given, giving the, the legacy, the living legacy of the movement. And they are organized actually in confederal forms of organization that uh, again, recalls what, uh, what can be found in the commune or in Rojava and that testify to the growing influence of, of direct democracy in, in France. So, these, these type of development are relevant also because they happen just before the municipal elections in France. And thanks to the movement in particular, uh, hundreds of participatory lists emerged in, in France. So lists that were um, more or less with different varying degrees of radicality, supporting uh, citizen empowerment 
and direct democracy in, uh, in their cities. So right now there's 66 of those lists that have won in France, which is quite meaningful because there were only one in the last elections in a place called Sion. Um, so these elections have really shown that there is a, a, an emerging desire for experimenting new forms of, of local democracy. Even if, um, again, we could talk about this, the comparison later also, it was still minor compared to the municipalist wave of Spain that happened a couple of years ago. So I won't go in the details about how they are uh, differentiating themselves, those, uh, those uh, lists and this movement, but we can find the different levels of, of radicality and of uh, relation to the state, relation to capitalism, different levels of, uh, uh, of uh, yeah, different degrees in this axis revolutionary to reformist that is quite, um, that can be seen as a strength, as some, something showing that the movement is building itself, building its own uh, branches and, uh, and, and coalitions, or something as more of a weakness, something that can be, uh, keep, prevent the movement from having a certain unity. But uh, beyond those, uh, those municipalities, we have several platforms uh, that have emerged also in this recent years, supporting this uh, municipalist communalist movement in France. Uh, one of them that's quite interesting is uh, called Fréquence Commune. They are actually a cooperative uh, whose role is to interconnect all of those uh, municipalities, the 66 ones. So you can check their website. It's, uh, they have a cartography of the, of the communes that were participated. And uh, other developments is the growth of the Institutes of Social Ecology um, that is, again, making the, this work of, uh, of uh, interconnecting and uh, building up the social ecology and, and communalism in France. So this was a bit the chronology of what has happened. And um, uh, for all of its significance, I think that uh, the commune, again, is uh, having a very important influence on this development and has a lot of lessons to, to give us. Um, but we need to be careful. And I think that, uh, again, like this, uh, the dichotomy between myth and reality that was raised here is very important because we need to be careful about not putting the commune into another historiography, which would be the libertarian one or communist one. Um, because after all, we also need to remember that the the federalist mutualist tendency in the elected commune, they were the, the minority. Um, but, uh, but still, it still means that the commune right now has kind of uh, been freed from the state communist imaginary. It's been freed also from certain Republican, French Republican uh, historiographies. And so it's very important to, to Again, to, to, to remember why and how in detail, in objective detail, it's important for uh, libertarian movements today. So now I'd like just to finish with three, I think uh, some of the main lessons that I think are, are very important in that regard. The first one is that the commune, which is also the cause of some of its contradictions, was it, it was a very pluralist uh, revolution. The elected commune, as has been said, had many tendencies, but this didn't prevent them from collaborating. Um, and the ideology called dogmas didn't have so much weight compared to the common goal of social emancipation. And actually it's a point that is raised in a, in a famous book about the commune of Christine Ross, Communal Luxury, which says that the confusion in theory um, was actually beneficial because it promoted association beyond the dogmas over sectarianism. And I think that this is a, a, a paramount lesson for the left today in general, which is still uh, splitting itself over uh, details, over certain, uh, over its differences, and forgetting the common grounds in the struggle against uh, capitalism, against consumerism, against patriarchy. Um, so I think this is a key, key lesson. And actually, France is a great example of how like these divisions are completely sabotaging the, the movement themselves. Um, so that, that would be the first lesson. The second lesson, I think, is that it was uh, democratic indeed, but most of it, it was also popular and educated, and that allowed this very fast development of democratic uh, institutions. No? Um, the masses of Paris in the Commune, they showed how fast this could happen, but also some of the conditions. 
uh, they show that uh, a constant presence of educated citizens in public affairs is a precondition for these things to happen. Um, one of the proof yeah, is the multiplication of the newspapers that we had seen. There were like uh, almost one per day emerging. Uh, there was also a, a very radical uh, revolutionary presence in, uh, in Paris before the Commune, obviously, with insurre insurrectional attempts that failed in October and, and January by Blankists. Um, all of this to say that it's a lesson in a sense, there's a lot of groundwork of popular revolutionary education to be done. If you want an insurrectional period to bring really democratic institutions in, uh, uh, and, and at such a, such a speed. And I think this is a lesson that was true also for the Spanish Civil War and for the Rojava Revolution, obviously where the work of the Kurdish liberation movement dates back uh, from many decades and not uh, start, did not start in 2012. Um, the last lesson, and I would like to finish on this, is what the commune can tell us about our, or the enemies, no? about the violence and the type of class hatred that can come from the bourgeois state. Uh, obviously, we all know the commune was eradicated on a unprecedented scales, that this class hatred uh, of the underclass and of the precariat is, is not uh, finished. Macron, for example, this year celebrated the, the Third Republic celebrated Napoleon. Um, so it's important to remember, thanks to the commune, uh, that the nation states, for all the competition and the borders that happen, they will always ally uh, beyond those borders. They will includingly, including turn to fascism if they have to, uh, when it comes to crushing an authentically popular and democratic revolution, where the underclass is transgressing the predetermined roles of producer, consumers, and, and voters. No? So that's a very important lesson. I think uh, it's also something that has, uh, for example, again, in this, uh, uh, in this regard, has influenced Elise Recluse, which is a precursor of the ecology movement and that I am heavily attached to the, the ideas, his ideas. It, it turned him, this violence, this class hatred, from republicanism to anarchism afterwards in the aftermath of the commune. So, all of this to say that there's so much more to cover about the commune, but I would like to, to close saying that indeed the, the commune was far from perfect. We need to be very careful about not closing it to our own libertarian narrative and being like the most objective possible. Um, it still remains a very inspiring laboratory, political laboratory, a prefigurative experiment that I think really still shows us how to invent a bit from the scratch, from the unknown, some of the realistic utopias that we, uh, we radically need today and that uh, hopefully uh, activists and, uh, and revolutionaries from, from Europe to liberated countries like uh, Chiapas and Rojava will, will continue to, to build in the future. So I think with this, we've covered so many aspects that uh, I really hope we will have a, a good discussion right now to discuss more. Thank you. Thank you, Theo. It was really complete. And thank you for all these uh, perspectives that uh, you draw. I think with uh, the three conclusions uh, that you have just mentioned about uh, the, plurali the pluralist approach of the commune, the need for popular education to free citizens, and the question of how to, to go beyond, the, uh, how to destroy a nation state, uh, which is related to producers, consumers, and and uh, voters uh, drew, uh, are very interesting points, maybe to raise uh, the debates. Uh, is there any question um, for the speakers here in the chat or uh, you can also uh, take the speech and uh, putting your, your video on if you want. Um, Someone asking for the website, uh, Stefan Becker, uh, what, what, what website, the tries one or uh, a website that has just been mentioned by CEO? What uh, website do you refer, Stefan? Um, is there any question, so? No? Uh, I, think, I think we have had a... Uh, very interesting debates with lots of, um, of debates, with, uh, interventions with lots of uh, uh, 
points that, that raise attention, no? Um, there are maybe a few places where we can have uh, contradictory uh, debates on the legacy of the commune. Um, thank you, Leonor. She has to leave now. And Frank, thank you for us attending. Well, um, I have maybe a question. Uh, Talking about Rojava, talking about the commune, do you think that uh, self-organization capacities of, of the population um, are really related um, to the war context, to the state of need, of, of absolute need? Because I think that um, it's, it's hard to create this union, this uh, unity in the diversity that you were referring to, Theo. It's very uh, difficult uh, to, to go beyond the, the different vision. And, and do you think that what would be, maybe it would, it would be a question for uh, all the, the speakers, what would be the, the preconditions uh, in Rojava or, or for Mitch and Dimitrios uh, in the commune, uh, which have made possible this self-organization that rose such uh, a, a collective capacity. Um, I was also thinking about, for instance, a, a, a very uh, less known commune, which is the commune in, of Guangzhou, in a way, Guangzhou is in South Korea, and in uh, eight, 1980, um, the people rose in May, uh, also the 18th of May, we celebrated this year the, the, 40th, uh, the 41th anniversary of May 80, 80s uprising in, in Guangzhou, South Korea, when during the Cold War, there were um, military power that was um, one that, that uh, uh, ordered the, the martial law. And the people of Guangzhou took the power, came to the street, they were hardly repressed, and they administrated a, a kind of commune, which uh, lasted, uh, uh, I think, one month, if I remember well. And this was also a very interesting experience that we should probably uh, invite next time to discuss with us. So uh, I was wondering, do we need to be in this state of need to react? And, and what can be the parallelism today with the state uh, of uh, the catastrophic state of the nature of the climate change? Is it an opportunity then to react collectively? Uh, and there is now a question also, maybe I, I raise the two questions. Uh, so Jason uh, sent us a question from YouTube. To what degree were, were the democratic decision-making processes of the commune a participatory process? And how accessible was this process to a Parisian worker? Maybe we can, we can ask Mitch uh, to answer this question. And there. Um, what was the what was the first part of it, Magali? I couldn't uh, make out the first okay. part of the question. Okay. So um, so uh, to what degree were the democratic decision making processes of the commune a participatory process? Okay. And how accessible was this process to a Parisian worker? Okay. So uh, the uh, it's actually a you know, as was, as was pointed out by, by Dimitri and I think also by you, Magali, you know, there were two levels of, of this process. There were the clubs, which were active. Uh, there was even a Jacobin club and they met in churches just as, as they used to. But as for the, uh, the commune itself, again, if you go to the, the debates within the commune, there was it was an elected body. They made all the decisions, and when they, there was it was proposed that the uh, journal officiel, the official journal that would report that reported on all the debates on the commune, should be distributed for free to everybody in Paris. 
So that was as close as you could come to letting everybody know exactly what was going on. It was voted down. The Blancists, who were uh, you know, an important part of the commune, were thought that this was a way of giving information to the enemy, or information to get into the hands of the enemy. So it wasn't open to the public at all. It's, it, you know, it's, it's a question that doesn't, so I'm glad that uh, that question was asked, because it's something that that surprised, again, surprised me reading the, the uh, reading the minutes, because I thought, you know, in fact, there was a bill passed that at least the Journal Officiel would be posted outside the Hotel de Ville, but that never took place either. So a lot of the deliberations were kept from uh, the public for fear that it would go in, into the wrong hands. So there's uh, my answer to, to that, that I that answered all Magali was the, uh, because it was not the people who who brought up the subjects for debate, you know. The uh, it was it was all handled by parliamentary procedure within the the commune with a different with a rotating presiding officer. So, thank you very much. Maybe well, Dimitri, yes, do you want to to add something? Uh, you you have to put your microphone yeah, on. Yeah, I want to say two things. One in reply to your question, Magali, at the beginning, and one in reply to what is being discussed right now. Uh, and and a final comment. Somebody asked a question: uh, Where do you find the information about Guangzhou that Magali talked about in Japan? Oh, yeah. It Magali did not talk about Korea. Japan. He, she talked about South Korea. It's it's a big city in South Korea, Guangzhou. Uh, but yeah. to answer your your question, Magali, the first one: Why, where, where, under what circumstances does the self-organization of people become a, a reality? Two things: one, uh, the capacity for self-organization on the part of ordinary human beings is always there under the skin of daily life and circumstances are what bring that capacity to the surface. And those circumstances are largely brought out into reality when people feel threatened. When people feel threatened by some enemy, it could be a whole variety of uh, different kinds of enemies under different circumstances, that is when people get together and start talking between houses, between neighbors, and so on and so forth. Now, the pandemic is an excellent indication of how people in so many parts of the world have gotten together, some for the first time, and created bonds of solidarity to help each other to fight the circumstances that the pandemic has imposed on them. That's an excellent example, okay? And you can think of urban struggles against so-called developers, what I call speculators, who come into a neighborhood and do all sorts of nasty things, nasty threats, and immediately people come out of their houses and say, what are we going to do? And what are we gonna to do together? So the capacity for self-organization, I suggest is always there under the skin circumstances pull it out and it becomes a mobilizing fact and uh, often more times than not it tends to be a self-organization that is mutualist that is horizontal and it's only the creepy crawlies of history who come in like cockroaches and try to establish authoritarian top-down you know, uh, organizations and political parties and say, no, follow us, follow us, we have the truth, but we will fight that tooth and nail. So that's that's what I would say in response to uh, uh, what, uh, what you asked, uh, uh, Magali. Thank you. And you wanted to add something else? Uh, sorry, Dimitri, uh, on the on the question of how participatory was the process of decisions during the commune? Well, again, you see, uh, I recommend, uh, although it takes a lot of time, to see the six hour film on the Paris Commune by Peter Watkins. Peter Watkins. Yeah. What do we experience during those six hours? Talk, talk, debate, debate, <laughs> talk, talk, debate, debate. The level of verbal exchanges 
during such an experience is incredible. It was incredible then, it is incredible throughout these kinds of moments in history. And of course, le affichage, you know, posters were going up and down regularly in all the arrondissements. And even though uh, the point was made that you didn't want to say too much so that Versailles doesn't pick up some kind of information, uh, radical newspapers were still being published and spread as widely as possible. Uh, the printing presses were as active uh, during uh, uh, 1871 as they were in 1889 and, uh, and uh, sorry, 1789 and 1792, 93. The printing presses were rolling all the time. So, you know, it's incredible how people find human ways to communicate, interpersonal ways to communicate before the internet. <laughs> Uh, Anna, you wanted to answer something. We have also other questions um, coming from YouTube. I, I will, I will uh, tell them. But um, Anna, you wanted to speak. Uh, yes. Um, just for the question, if uh, war is a precondition for getting out uh, or for uh, the possibility of people to take steps of self-organization, I. Think and we experienced here also uh, that war is not um, supporting uh, self-organization, democratic uh, self-organization of people. Um, the crisis of the system itself uh, makes it necessary and uh, the discontent that people have, uh, uh, I would agree with this, like there, there is something that is threatening people's lives and this uh, is the reason maybe for people uh, to see the need to, uh, to get up to do something and uh, to defend themselves. But uh, for instance, for the process in Rojava, many things uh, that were developed or for instance, the processes of uh, communes election, people's councils elections uh, that we had in uh, 2017 was interrupted due to the um, war of Turkey on Afrin and the, and the occupation. And um, so also, uh, of course, organizing needs some sort of defense and uh, security uh, when there's the, when you are attacked on a uh, bombardment uh, or at any time a bomb can explode, then of course um, it, the conditions to um, uh, um, organize um, election processes and things like this uh, are much harder, just to give uh, one example. Um, so I also think it's not the hunger that makes people uh, go on the streets, uh, but uh, it is uh, to see that there's or realize uh, that there is injustice uh, and um, to like to see uh, that um, something Needs, needs to change to feel this need 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 for for, for change and uh, not uh, yeah you don't need to be hungry by yourself uh, in order to uh, get organized uh, it's uh, also about realizing what is going on what uh, power games are, are played uh, and uh, how people are objectified and uh, not uh, to accept this anymore Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, we have a question here on the chat. Uh, so about the education of children. Um, so uh, could anyone speak to the way the commune approached the education of children? Were there any early libertarian experiments like in Barcelona later on? Uh, maybe, yes? Dimitri, you have an answer well, first, to this question? First, first, Let's first go. Of, yeah, first of all, uh, I, I made the point that the Paris Commune uh, introduced uh, in a very forceful way the separation of church and state. Uh, all, all, up until then, the church controlled all of education. And of course, women were not included. Uh, the commune introduced free education for everybody without exception. Uh, and what was also extremely important is that the churches were used as meeting places. In other words, there was an entente 
between uh, the communards and the priests and the nuns. You could use it during the day, but we gonna use it, we're gonna use the churches during the night. And <laughs> during the night, we're all the, where all the neighborhood assemblies were taking place, all the revolutionary clubs met in the churches, uh, whether, the, whether the priests liked it or not. And in, again, Peter Watkins' film, it shows how the young children were brought together for the first time and an educational experience started to uh, be constructed with new texts to read and new songs to uh, sing and et cetera, et cetera. So education was a very, very important uh, experience, as it is, of course, in the Kurdish freedom movement. Yes, maybe to add that there were a project uh, led by a woman, uh, a teacher who, whose name was Maria Verdure, uh, who, who created with uh, other um, teachers, there were maybe 60. A project for a new school that was debated in Am I the only one? There's, there's Mitch. Yeah, it, from uh, Jean Francois Duperon and uh, the, the question of the education. Hello, is, is there a problem with, with Magali, it seems, no? Oh, okay. Yeah, it does seem Magali has lost Do her. You... Magali. Right. <laughs> I mean, maybe what before she comes back, I can add something about the, the education part. Um, I think that one of the concepts that is extremely promising and that actually has been developed a lot by Kropotkin in particular in the future and that is really needs to be actualized today is the concept of- Hello. Magali. Hello. Hello. You... Yeah, no, just I, I, I wanted to say this, that uh, there was at that time, um, uh, from from uh, 30 years, uh, uh, almost 30 years in France, um, uh, reflections uh, um, and uh, intellectual movements around the role of education. And this uh, Maria Verdure and uh, and her husband uh, Verdure, Verdure, uh, and um, uh, they, they, they developed this question uh, based on exp um, uh, education, different recognition of different type of knowledge, obviously uh, like uh, laic uh, uh, um, education, free education. And those are very interesting principles uh, that have been uh, uh, brought by these people. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry because uh, I've lost my the chat and I've lost the question. So Jason, maybe you can put the question. Okay. Okay. So there is a question here. Uh, does the commune teach us any lessons on how to organize in less densely populated regions, such as suburban sprawl or rural communities? How does it exist? How do these lessons differ from the example set by Rajava? So maybe somebody want to answer? Look, Magali, if I may, I'm going to... Um... You hear me? Yeah. I wanted just to... Yeah, yeah. yes. To jump, back, to jump back in in the, in the education uh, debate and then focus on what has been uh, named no integral education because I think it's very important and it focuses on the, on the, um, the approach of the education commission but also of, uh, like uh, the revolutionary teachers uh, like Louis Michel for that matter during the commune to break with the dichotomy between the mental education and the, the physical education no? to break with the dichotomy between the people that 
uh, basically build things and the people that think and that use their brains between hand and, uh, and, and brains again. And I think this is a crucial distinction uh, when it comes to, to dismantling a little bit the, the type of labor specialization that we are uh, living today. It's, uh, it's uh, ideas within education that has been uh, uh, very important for Kropotkin and his books on, uh, on fields and workshops. And I mean, it's, it's an idea that has a lot of potential when it comes to really thinking about an education that uh, allow Again, the diversity of skills to be shared equally among, among people. I think it's a level where uh, diversity of access to skills uh, beyond the boundaries between um, uh, thought and, uh, and, and, and matter and the doing uh, is extremely important. So this concept of integral education that was present in the commune, I think is something that also uh, has a lot of potential and lessons for us to, to, to think about. Yes, so lots of pedagogues and uh, lots of uh, teachers were involved in the commune and uh, lots of women uh, through this. I also mentioned uh, Alecole de la Commune uh, from Marguerite de Foucault. Lots of works have been developed. Uh, maybe somebody wants to answer the question of the rural areas. I think it's a quite important question because uh, uh, yes, can a commune take place um, in a rural area or um, uh, is this question of the, the urban uh, uh, as a place for the state of power, um, uh, for the state of, of power relations uh, is crucial in this question of uh, being a, the communal revolutions. Uh, because uh, in the commune there was also the idea of destroying the the or um, of uh, uh, yes uh, destroying the the power the official power. So uh, someone wants to answer the question of the of the rural areas if if there is a possibility of commune in the rural areas. Well, I'll just make I'll just make a brief statement. Then I I have to go. I've only I give, only gave this two hours. But to keep in mind that the enemy of the commune okay. were the rural, that the, it was the city against the country as much as it was Paris against France. And uh, on the other hand, the, the goal of the commune was a federation of communes that had the uh, rural communities organized into communes. Their goal, as was they always talking about the, the yellow vests, would be, would be or a federation of communes. So be the commu all the communes in France would become the, the government of France. But in fact, the, the army that, that killed and crushed the commune was, uh, was largely uh, from, the, from the, the countryside. Uh, just as during the French Revolution, it was the Vendée, it was the peasants of Normandy who opposed the, the revolution. So I just wanna you know, thank you all for this. You know, I have to scoot now. Thank you, Mitch. Okay, so great Thank meeting you. So you. Much for, great uh, meeting you all. Okay, bye bye. Okay, bye. Au revoir. Bye. Thank you. Au revoir. Thank you. Um, we can we can share uh, in the in the in the web 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 page of uh, tries uh, some uh, papers from uh, Mitch. So there is another question. Um, to the speakers, how do we deal with the class contradictions within geographical communities? In Vienna, it's not unheard or for your landlord to live in the same building of your boss to live in your district. I don't want to be organizing with people whose interests I are opposed to mine, so fundamentally, surely. Sorry, uh, maybe I do not understand very well the question, um, but I will follow the, the reading. So when do class interests override the pluralist ideal or feminist or queer liberation interest for uh, that matter? Do conservative elements have to be given a say in assemblies when this would leach power from, from marginalized groups. Did the commune try to be 
too broad in its inclusion. So the question of Sam, uh, for the speakers, you can see it in the chat. Maybe it's easier to read it because I think it was a dense question. Uh, somebody wants to answer this. I, I think it's around the articulation of class domination relations and, and creating a, a commune uh, from the neighborhoods. Yes, Dimitri. Well, thank uh, you. Uh, to the extent that the, uh, uh, the statement uh, Include so many different questions. Uh, I will just take part of it to the extent that I could understand it. Uh, with reference to Vienna, uh, we talk about today the Paris Commune. I wish we can also organize a webinar on Red Vienna. I wonder how many people who are listening to this webinar even know about Red Vienna. Red Vienna came into existence in immediately after the, the First World War. And it was under a socialist, uh, a left socialist administration up until when the Nazis came in and took over Vienna and Austria. But while the socialists were part of the government of Vienna, Vienna built the most extensive public housing uh, project in the history of urban development in Europe at that time. I mean, uh, and, and those magnificent buildings are still there. Take for example, one that I visited several times when I was last in Vienna called the Karl Marx Hof, H-O-F. The huge complex, magnificent, magnificently built and not only housing for working class people uh, and low income people, but also it had a nursery in it, it had a laundromat in it, it had a collective kitchen space in it, and so on and so forth. And uh, when I left the building, I noticed on the wall uh, bullet marks. And those bullet marks represented the working population that lived in those buildings defending that building when the Nazi stormtroopers were coming into that part of Vienna. So it's, it's a great history. It shows how different people got together and worked together and built the most incredible housing projects uh, that you can possibly imagine. So I could give that kind of an example uh, over and above the Paris Commune on how a municipal government, a left municipal government can actually create circumstances where uh, working class and poor people uh, can live together harmoniously in a big, uh, very prosperous uh, and prosperous city called Vienna. Okay. Now that I've read again the question of Sam, I think it's uh, raising really interesting questions on the, the question that um, how do you go beyond class uh, and, and the di differences of, of interests uh, in the same geographical area? No, maybe uh, he's mentioning also the, the question of um, uh, the different interests maybe uh, between um, um, how do you deal with this uh, giving a power to the people who already has power and more power and are in the domination process? Uh, for instance, in an assemblies, uh, do you give the speech to the people uh, that, that are conservative? And do this speech uh, would uh, pr prejudice a uh, marginalized group? So it's very interesting, the question of how do we include all the people uh, in, including in, in, in the, the, from the more marginalized to the more conservative? Do we have to include everybody uh, beyond the, the differences of interest? I think that maybe Anna and the Roger cases can, can be a very good demonstration of that because it seems to be when we hear you that at the beginning, uh, women and men had, 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 had really different uh, interests in the patriarchy uh, system. No? When you mentioned that uh, uh, some way uh, uh, men had uh, privileges uh, towards women. 
And then you, I think you mentioned something, but maybe you want you want to to answer Anna. But you mentioned some of you mentioned that by talking, uh, everything uh, can be can be solved in a way, you know, in the process of of the revolution. So I think it would be interesting maybe to to know the 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 way uh, uh, Rojava society. Uh, has, has created this inclusion beyond the different communities, beyond the men and women and the, the power relation that was structuring the, the, the society before the revolutionary process. I think the most important thing is to have basic common principles um, and uh, to have uh, to build up uh, respect uh, for one another, like to see what diversities that there are and that diversities uh, within a society are not something that is threatening uh, one another, but that is uh, uh, en enriches uh, all. So for instance, um, just to give the example of the different uh, religious communities, um, um, in the village where we stay um, for a long time, uh, for instance, um, before the revolution, the Yazidis could not celebrate uh, their um, uh, traditional celebrations unless they would pay uh, some uh, huge amount of money to some uh, state agents uh, so that they would uh, stay silent because according to the um, uh, yeah, ideology of the Syrian uh, Arab Republic. Uh, there are no Yazidis. Uh, you're either Muslim or you're Christian, but Yazidis are not existing, and Yazidi kids had uh, either forcibly to join uh, the Muslim uh, religious education or were thrown out of the class. So, um, and also in the passports, they were reg registered as uh, Muslim. And uh, even in society, um, it was not a very open hostility, but it was an approach of uh, like neighbors would not go and eat uh, some uh, food that was made by uh, an, like a Muslim uh, family would not go and eat the food of a Yazidi neighbor or the Yazidis were going into town to sell uh, the yogurt they made and the people ask from which village are you, are you from that village, then it's possible that you're Yazidi, no, uh, thank you, I will buy my yogurt somewhere else. So these kind of um, prejudices and discriminations uh, have, uh, have uh, shaped uh, the mentality for, for, for long years. But uh, with the process uh, that started, uh, like the, the organizing process that started and to see uh, that, um, uh, like uh, to connect the communes, not to have the fear of the state and agents anymore, but uh, to see uh, or the self-organization process of the different communities uh, when uh, a house of the Yazidi community was built up. Then also the Muslim neighborhood got interested and uh, went there and uh, yeah, discussing, really getting to know each other uh, um, created a very important basis and uh, to see uh, that you can rely on one another. And um, uh, then now we have a situation where um, the Muslim uh, families uh, go and celebrate uh, the um, traditional uh, holidays of the Yazidis and the Yazidis go and celebrate together with the Muslims and the Christians. So um, this is maybe one example, but um, to see that um, uh, this um, mentality of um, yeah, uh, dividing and ruling and uh, um, uh, domination of uh, one uh, nation or one religion um, uh, can, there, there are mechanisms to overcome it, but uh, it still uh, also needs a process, but therefore you have to have the principles of uh, common respect, uh, acknowledgement of self-organization of each community. And we have uh, many holidays because there are Christian uh, holidays, uh, there is uh, Eastern, there's Chasham Basur, uh, then there's uh, also the uh, Muslim uh, um, uh, 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 at, the, at the same time, so from time to time, we have quite a lot of holidays, um, of course. Um, 
but this is something uh, very important to give uh, an official or a public space uh, to for expression uh, to all of this uh, cultural and linguistic uh, diversity. And another, um, we, I think, very important step was uh, the implementation of the co-chair system and equal representation of women and men uh, in sense of numbers in all uh, bodies. So it's not only a co-chair system, let's say, uh, in the um, council of the uh, uh, autonomous administration that is uh, coordinating all the different um, people's councils in the different regions and districts and, and so on. But uh, in each part uh, of society, let's say in the school, there wouldn't be a headmaster of a school, there would be a co-chair of the school. So a man and a woman uh, at, in the, at the same level would be uh, responsible for organizing uh, the school uh, in, in, in this place. At the hospital, you have a, a co-chair at uh, the, let's say, at, um, uh, in the cooperatives, you have a man and a woman together being co-chairs or co-spokespersons uh, for, for this place. And, but it's not only that you say uh, that at the level of, uh, let's say, spokespersons or uh, coordinating mechanisms, but you also have the equal presentation uh, that, uh, like in sense of, uh, uh, and within the councils and in each commission, if it's health, if it's defense, if it's um, 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 yeah, what any kind of culture uh, or um, even children's uh, uh, self-organization, um, you have this uh, being implemented and this makes really uh, a change if somebody like, and, um, but it has also been a struggle. So in the beginning, it was more like uh, that the man said, I I'm the chair and you're the co-chair. But uh, like the women's movement said, no, co-chair means you as a man are a co-chair as well as the woman is a co-chair and you have to cooperate. And, and you both of you, until you haven't signed a document, this document is not valid. Only the signature of the man and the stamp of the commune is not uh, giving validity like until uh, the women's co-chair who is at the same time uh, presenting uh, the organized will of all the women in the communes doesn't give the content, uh, we cannot accept this uh, decision. So um, uh, these kind of uh, mechanisms have also and or quotas uh, like to ensure representation of the different uh, social, national and religious uh, group uh, um, are, uh, and also of the youth. Uh, the, the youth also has its own commissions. Um, uh, one uh, yeah, possibility also um, to um, yeah to uh, define uh, yeah to give the possibility of uh, expression and uh, meet on the basis of uh, common principles. Uh, there is a, uh, I think, uh, uh, thank you very much, Anna. There are more questions for you, but there is first a question from um, uh, Vasilis uh, towards Dimitrios. Could you please, could you please tell us the, bi the bibliographic source of the inclusion of non-French people in the commune, Algerians and etc. And maybe if I can allow me, uh, I have a, I have a little uh, uh, answer also to this question. And then uh, we will go to another more question, but more based on the protests um, in, uh, in uh, Rojava. Uh, uh, Magali, I will answer Vasilis's question um, by writing it out and sending it to him and to everybody else. How's that? Okay. Well, I just wanted to mention something important, I think, to my view. At, at, at the commune time, there were 100,000 uh, immigrants in Paris, which was uh, quite an important industrial or pre-industrial because as uh, Mitch said, uh, there were a lot of little factories mainly in Paris. And there were 100,000 uh, people 
um, from uh, workers or refugees, no, uh, political refugees or somehow uh, Jewish refugees, um, and uh, mainly from Poland and uh, Italy. And um, uh, it, it, it has to be said that uh, there were, so through them, uh, the, the internationalism of the commune wa was very present. People also came from uh, different parts of Europe uh, to, to take part to the commune. Uh, Leo Frankel was mentioned, he, he came from Hungary and he was uh, uh, near to Marx. At that time, he was corresponding with him. But it has to be said that uh, at, the at the time of the Commune, uh, in uh, 1830, uh, Algerian uh, colonization um, has begun since 1813 by uh, the 1830, sorry, uh, by the French uh, uh, Restoration, which was a time of uh, monarchy uh, after the revolution. And uh, that Napoleon III, who was uh, ruling, ruling the, the empire, uh, well, was also uh, really um, colonialist. So it's absolutely uh, true that there is a lack in the Paris Commune uh, to mention uh, the solidarity with uh, uh, the colonized people. And it has to be recognized. It was almost absent from the, this, from the debates. And uh, uh, it's, it's important uh, to, to see that there were no transparency, but uh, because the, the first colonization was mostly uh, military in, in uh, Algeria, uh, but it, it, it was, I think there is a lack and um, most of the, some of the uh, authors on the, and searchers on the commune mentioned it as, as a very strong lack uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the commune uh, people. Uh, for instance, uh, Quentin Duluermoz, uh, who, who mentioned like, uh, that at the same time of the commune, there were a, co uh, um, a riot and uprising against colonization in Kabylie, which is a northern region of uh, Algeria, and there were no solidarity. And there were, it, 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 there were, um, uh, uh, an Alger, Algiers commune uh, supported by the colonialists also. It has to be mentioned, eh? uh, advocating for more rights, uh, more in depth, more uh, autonomy for the uh, colony, uh, for the people living in the colony uh, at that time. Uh, more rights, I mean, in, in, in terms of uh, decentralization, no? uh, being uh, Algeria, uh, a French region at that time, the, the colonizers wanted uh, more um, right to, to self-administrate themselves. So, uh, and this is important because it's quite a break, a breakout, I could say, uh, now in the, uh, how do in the French society, uh, can we recognize uh, the, the 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 different legacy of the of the of the, the different legacies of of the um, emancipation? And there is a part of um, a movement called the uh, Rep uh, Indigenous of the Republic, calling for uh, that 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 goes uh, until uh, saying that. Um, uh, the, the people's rights, uh, the French people's rights, uh, were, um, um, were the results of the colonization. No? The working class rights uh, that would have been allowed uh, by the riot, the uprising, by this uh, movement, this social movement, uh, uh, they are reproached. Uh, to to have been uh, um, got uh, thanks to the colonization that allowed uh, the creation of wealth in France and then the sharing of wealth. This is uh, an important uh, contradiction uh, now in the social movement in France. And uh, this is important to explore uh, that uh, it's not, uh, well, it is quite uh, polemic. 
and uh, it has to be recognized. Yeah. Um, then another question to Anna. Sorry, because it is uh, it's quite late, so we have eight minutes more. If you agree. Um, so Genealogy Academy, uh, could you tell us what kind of solution they are thinking to implement for the issue of the prices of gas now currently in Rojava? And could you tell us more about the protests that happen against it? Plus to this, could you tell us more stories about this kind of tension between the administration and people? Yes, I think it was uh, quite new for us to know that uh, there are uh, uh, uprising against the uh, autonomous administration in Rojava. Can you please tell us a little bit more on this, Anna? Thank you. I mean, to call it uprising would be uh, a bit uh, too far, but there were protests, of course, and critics uh, um, about uh, this decision. Um, yeah, because uh, the economic situation in all Syria, but especially here in the region, uh, is quite uh, got quite hard, uh, um, uh, as I already uh, told, to, due to external facts. Um, but um, of course, I think, uh, and this kind of uh, uh, like the discontent uh, was about, uh, yeah, that uh, people felt uh, there should be a more uh, broader discussion process uh, and uh, dif different ways of, uh, of solution uh, than uh, like uh, putting prices on uh, very uh, basic uh, things. Of course, the democratic uh, autonomy administration also has to import these things and they have also to pay these high prices for the gas bottles that we receive uh, if we receive them uh, from um, uh, Iraq or southern uh, Kurdistan region. So um, it's then more a question of uh, how you can ensure uh, to have uh, this distribution in the, in the e economy. Uh, on one hand, that uh, it's necessary to find possibilities to be less uh, dependent on uh, import uh, from, from outside. Uh, to see, um, I mean, there has been uh, many uh, projects, also cooperatives that have been working on different ways of, uh, let's say, agriculture to overcome this uh, monoculture agriculture that uh, was uh, enforced by the, by the, by the state. Um, and, uh, but of course, things like gas uh, cookers, um, then we have to think of how, what can we use instead of gas? Uh, uh, I mean, there are no trees, or there's the. Um, we try to also to to uh, plant trees and to make Rojava green again. There's also a campaign going on uh, on this uh, point. So uh, there are no uh, wood resources uh, that are available instead. Uh, maybe there's something to get uh, to find if there's a possibility to have more petrol cookers, but. Uh, things like this, like for each uh, um, possibility to see how, what it's about uh, to think what are the resources and what, how can we create alternatives that do not uh, make the region uh, and the people dependent on uh, things that somehow have to be bought through, through dollar. Uh, but of course we know uh, there's uh, no place in this world that is outside disconnected from the whole um, capitalist hegemony and uh, all the impacts, uh, the globalist uh, system of uh, exploitation. And um, so um, uh, it is like if, uh, for instance, in other parts of the world, there would be um, also where, where there are also technological uh, possibilities to uh, support also this process in their own places, but also sharing it, for instance, with Rurava, then this can be also an option. For instance, we have now uh, in the Women's Village, uh, Genoa, a part of the energy we can um, gain from uh, solar panels, 
but it's not easy to get solar panels because again we don't have a factory or a manufacturer where we can produce uh, ourselves solar panels so that's just, then again uh, it depends on the situation of embargo borders uh, dollars and so on that makes things like this very expensive but of course it might be an, uh, an idea for instance for um, uh, um, cooperatives or uh, people that work in solar energy uh, uh, workshops uh, to start a campaign to uh, make more supplies of uh, uh, solar energy systems for Rojava. This can be, for instance, uh, a solution, uh, ecological as well uh, as uh, making the uh, possibilities for the people uh, less dependent. I don't know if this is what I can say, but, but I think it's also very important that uh, after the, um, uh, like three days after uh, when the, uh, like the uh, declaration was made, public declaration was made that the prices would rise uh, for gas and uh, petrol. And uh, when the, when the um, admin, uh, administration withdrew this and uh, said that uh, due to the projects that have been made, uh, they uh, reconsidered it. I think it's also very important that uh, it created actually more a trust uh, than it was that there was an anger. It was also the slogans on the uh, demonstrations uh, were um, uh, uh, withdraw this. Uh, we, we want the withdrawal of this um, um, uh, decision and she had numbered them. Like we are with uh, uh, the Matthias who sacrificed their lives for this uh, revolution. And in the end, after it was withdrawn, also many people uh, said uh, that this was. Uh, what what they they expected and it's not it was not that this uh, uh, was a kind of let's say tension in a way of uh, questioning the legitimacy uh, of the um, uh, autonomous administration but uh, to request to uh, reconsider a decision that is not accepted by the people and that happened and I think uh, something like this is uh, more uh, is is an important uh, um, experience for how to develop um, dem uh, democracy here and uh, uh, to see what is the difference between between representative democracy and uh, direct democracy because so, uh, as you have the uh, possibility to withdraw mandates, you have the possibility to make uh, decisions that are not accepted by the population to in a very short time to revise it and to uh, think for a better solution. So in uh, this sense, I think, um, yeah, it's uh, an important process that is going on. But at the same time, of course, we know that there are also other forces that one, especially Turkey, where propaganda was made, it was still like uh, some things of uh, uh, different groups uh, also tried uh, to use this uh, situation and uh, uh, yeah, were, uh, were hoping that uh, something would uh, turn out that Turkey again could use for uh, new op occupation efforts. Uh, so it's also a very, uh, yeah, fragile or very um, a situation where um, uh, many powers make uh, uh, their, uh, uh, yeah, want to gain advantage from situations, but uh, to see. Um, how you can really uh, continue uh, continue on putting uh, the democratic principles of this revolution in practice. You're you're muted, okay. Miguel. Uh, thank you, thank you, right. thank you very much, Anna, for uh, for this um, answer. Uh, I think there is a last question um, on uh, for Theo 
Uh, I think it's a clarification question. Um, so about the way in which we can avoid sabotaging movement and ways to agree on common principles without getting lost in the dogmas. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Magali. Um, yeah, I think I think it's it kind of can be linked back again also to some things I had to say about the earlier question of, of SWAT about like class, no. Um, I think yeah, this this raises questions that are extremely important because if you're pro democracy, I think you shouldn't you shouldn't be afraid of it, no. Uh, in the sense that uh, yes, there are class differences, and and in the end, unless you have a revolutionary period like uh, like was seen in uh, in Paris and like in and in other places, if you are defending direct democratic institutions in your localities and uh, the yellow vest, I mean the French municipalism. Uh, today is a good example. There's there is no power vacuum. There is the state, same still uh, capitalist society in place. And what happens is that we have these growing institutions. Well, obviously there will be at some point where a boss, a worker, an unemployed, a politician, and a capitalist will, will will be together in the same assembly. The issue is how power is distributed. The issue is uh, is how power is distributed, and that that's the political dimension, no? Like decentralizing power ultimately is uh, should be the key and in the sense that what you want is to have everybody like I mean not all the classes together uh, in the same assembly what you want is simply to lower the differences between the classes until the moment where they are abolished so in, in order to have uh, assemblies where these differences are less um, prone to generate uh, conflicts no but that raises obviously the economic question because classes, if you go back to the Marxist definition, it's a matter of like ownerships of the mean of production that then generated a certain culture around class. So obviously with, without a revolutionary process, you shouldn't either expect the bourgeois class and the elite to just renounce to their property, renounce to their economic privilege and become like one other vote along with other workers in, in an assembly. So I think, yeah, whether you talk about Rojava or whether you talk about uh, 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 an insurrectional uprising context um, where you still have the same state structures in place it's it's completely different but it's it's uh, it's interesting in that sense to go back to the commune and to see what has happened because if you if you actually look at the elected commune and that maybe goes a little bit more to the the plurality issue that I raised in the talk what you find out is that actually in the commune there was elected people that were um, that were uh, called the conciliators. Their actual idea was to talk with Versailles and to reconciliate in a way to, to find agreements. And in like they were obviously a minority and faced with the revolutionary majority of the commune, they left it. They left it. So the whole of the commune then became um, what is usually described as the composition of the commune, which is the internationalists, the blankists and the, and the Jacobites. But you see that that's the trick, no? is that then then you had uh, a commune, a revolutionary uh, hotel de ville that was able to kind of transcend their dogmas. Meaning Jacobins being statist, uh, the internationalists being closest to what you would call later the anarchist tendency. What has happened is that they went beyond this to make the, the decisions that they took. But that plurality is also needs to be put in the context of uh, not a total plurality because some elected people were also uh, had to drop the commune because of their uh, idea to, to conciliate with Versailles. So they were not revolutionaries. So what has happened is you had uh, common grounds between revolutionaries, but not it, it, obviously the spectrum cannot be uh, wide enough. If you are working in a, uh, to, to con reconciliate anarchists and fascists, it's, it's not going to work very well. So there is this issue of... Um, of, I think, ideological spectrum you're talking about and whether you, you're talking about a revolutionary context or not. But uh, more broadly, the, the plurality issue that I wanted to, to raise, I think, is really um, going back to the idea of unity and diversity, no? as something that is both an end and but also a mean, really. Because if you think about it, like, uh, again, taking as an example the, the commune, there's a famous quote by, the, by Bismarck, I have it here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it because it's very, uh, I mean, it encapsulates a little bit uh, this discussion. It says, crown heads, wealth and privilege may well tremble should ever again the black and the red unite. Right, so we have here a representative of the, the, of the, 
of the enemy, if you want to call it this way, telling you this. And then you realize that it's been 150 years of division between anarchists and Marxists. You can add to that the socialists and then the social democrats right now. And now we have like a left that is more divided than ever. So when you have somebody from the, the elite class telling you that, yeah, actually what we sh they should be really fearing is the unity of the left, well, then you have an idea of the potential of uh, dropping a certain sense of ideological purity that in the end just makes you really weak uh, to make sometimes compromises and coalitions with people that do not agree with you, no? So that's the, this idea of, yeah, unity and diversity. And I think it's very important when you talk also about like, uh, their movement, no? activism as such. No? Like, I think there is a term that I really like and that uh, was raised by a member of the Institute of Social Ecology, that's the single issue activism. Is that we need, right now, what, we need, what needs to happen, at least in my opinion, is to transcend this single issue activism. Right now, we're all conscious that there, is, uh, uh, there are feminist movement, there is decolonial movement, there is the green movement, there is the labor movement, there are all sorts of movements. And what needs to happen is to, is to put them together, is to have one movement, one movement that proposes an alternative. And this is, this is both extra parliamentary and parliamentary, in my opinion, like uh, that's what's need to happen. A unity in diversity where everybody realizes that they bring different aspects to the struggle, but then that the common goal is the same. So I think that, yeah, at least in my, in my opinion, I think the left will not reach uh, victories unless this actually happens. And actually, I, I, I want to say finally, just uh, uh, something that Dimitri told me actually uh, about the 60s and how the movement in the 60s started as one movement and ended as different movements and got weaker because of that. In, uh, in that division. Then it was the civil rights movement. Then it was the gay movement. Then it was the many sorts of different movements, not the environmentalist movement, etc. So I think that today we are in the opposite situation, or at least it, that's what needs to happen. And that's it. I will finish on that to create one movement. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dimitri, I suppose you, it's, you don't want to answer? Maybe we will organize a next webinar, uh, the next conference, or, or just a word for the conclusion because it's already very late and we are fewer yes, and fewer. Yes. I, I just want to say to all of us that are left, a very big thank you to Magali, to Anna, <laughs> to Theo, to Jason, who made the wonderful technological connection between Montreal, New York on the one hand, and Rojava on the other. Absolutely fantastic collaboration. It just shows you internationalism works. <laughs> yes, definitely, and it's needed. Thank you. Uh, but, so thank you very much to all of us for attending this conference. Uh, you will be able to see it online on YouTube, on the channel of uh, TRIES, uh, also on the website of TRIES, uh, which I put you in the chat, uh, TRIES.org, T-R-I-S-E.org. Uh, you can register on our newsletter and receive information. Uh, we will organize uh, soon a webinar on direct democracy, with Javor Tavinsky, which is from Hatton, who is from Hatton, and uh, also a lot of interesting uh, events to come. Um, so please uh, follow this. Uh, oh, yes, Jason, you put here in the chat uh, the link to forward or to see again the conference. So uh, thank you very much. Good night, good evening, or good uh, afternoon. Uh,